On the adventurous trail of Robert William Service. The second main part in Robert's life takes place in Europe. Robert is asked by the Toronto Star to become war correspondent in the recently fighting Balkans. Unhesitatingly, the adventurous poet without ties in Canada accepts this new challenge and boards for Europe. Based firstly in Istanbul, Robert enrolls in the Red Crescent in order to be as close as possible to the war area. The poet takes care of the wounded in San Sofia, then he delivers rice in a refugee camp struck by a cholera epidemic. Then, sometime after, his superior discovers that he is a darn reporter and immediately discharges him. In the same time, Robert is followed by the Turkish police, suspecting him of being an informer which compels him to escape the country in a great hurry. Robert, released of his war correspondent duties, chooses to discover the flourishing European capitals Sofia, Bucharest, Budapest, Vienna and Berlin, while carrying on writing articles for the Toronto Star, sharing travelling comments and picturesque anecdotes. Robert chooses to stop in Paris, where he is leading the lively bohemian's life of that time, wandering on the Grand Boulevard, dreaming in the Luxembourg Gardens, spending hours at Montparnasse trendy cafe terraces. He has been always attentive to the cultural emulation of this melting pot of colorful characters, enabling him to find inspiration for his new book of poetry, having the Parisian capital for background. Befriending artistic circles, Robert met international reporters, successful writers like Blasco Ibanez, and budding painters such as Kiss Van Dongen, Lupiov Popova or The Armington, a Canadian couple with whom he will develop an indefectible friendship. Years later, the poet will cross again the road of Kiss van Dongen in Monaco and of Ibanez in Menton. Robert's carefree life ends on a sunny and cheerful Mardi Gras day when his look comes across a Parisian, Germaine Bourgoin. The young lady is an embroiderer and foremost, she speaks English. Love at first sight it's them, and three months later they get married. For their honeymoon, the sweethearts visit London, the Anglo-Norman island of Jersey, and they travel along the Brittany Emerald Coast, enjoying bicycling between Saint-Malo and Dinar. The couple fold and there's a charm of a village called Lancieux and more particularly by a newly built isolated house overhanging the waterfront which the poet buys and baptizes Dream Heaven. The couple jubilantly takes part to summer activities practiced in the Bay of Lancieux, such as walking along the beach at low tide and picking up shales and shrimps, joyful moments that will nourish the poet's inspiration who composes lyrical rhymes about Brittany. On a sinister summer afternoon, the alarm bell was sounded. Whoa, whoa, we're shooting Lancieux inhabitants. Being over 40, Robert had passed the edge of active service. But he wanted to enroll a Scottish battalion, but his application was rejected due to varicose vein on his legs. Nevertheless, the poet strongly wants to join the army, not for killing, but to share his countrymen's fate and, most of all, to bring them help on the front line. With a great tenacity, Robert finally managed to join an ambulance driver corps newly constituted by the American Red Cross. The poet leaves for the front line in northern France, where he will be under German artillery fire.
After the war, Robert will be decorated of four medals. And the months spent on the battlefields among wounded and injured soldiers inspires him to write powerful poems with tragic accents. Rhymes of a Red Cross man dedicated to his youngest brother, Lieutenant Albert Service, killed in action at Ypres in Belgium. Enlisted under the condition not to write, the poems of an ambulance stretcher bearer were some of the first accounts not authorized by the government depicting the hell of the war. Robert's attempt was not to celebrate the war soundness, neither battle's victory, nor to encourage country antagonism but to reveal the sore distress of the soldiers in their muddy trenches and the distress of their wives, describing it with the same tragic strength as in his Yukon poems. Like a gleam of hope during the wartime, Robert's wife gave birth to twin girls, Iris and Doris. The family doctor suggests spending few weeks under the Riviera's warm weather, and that's how Robert Service discovers the south of France. Sadly, Doris catches scarlet fever and dies at the age of 13 months in Menton. That sudden loss deeply depresses Robert and his wife. But from this date, the couple decided to come back each winter like in a pilgrimage on their daughter's grave. The following winter, the couple chooses a small furnished apartment in Monaco. Obviously, Robert's mind is shaping a new novel plot, a story of gamblers and love. To nourish his imagination, the poet hangs out every day around the gambling tables of Monte Carlo Casino, studies the techniques to break the bank and observes the compulsive gamblers betting the life with dice, and therefore writes The Poisoned Paradise, a romance of Monte Carlo, later adapted to cinema. The poet traveling passion is still waiting any occasion to burst out. In 1921, Robert and his family leave for a transatlantic journey towards New York then to Edmonton to introduce his wife and daughter to his mother, and then all the way down to prosperous Hollywood, where Robert's poems were adapted for silent movies, notably by a cinema pioneer, French director, by the way, named Alice Guy Blachich. Inspired by Stevenson's way in the Pacific Islands, the poet's ventures all by himself for a three months' journey at the discovery of Tahiti and Morea. Impregnated by the Polynesian atmosphere, Robert writes the intrigue of a new novel, the fictional life story of a wrongly accused innocent taking place mainly in Tahiti, published under the title The Roughneck, A Tale of Tahiti. During the peaceful twenties, the poet, his wife and growing daughter Iris dwell each year in their seaside house in Brittany. At that time, the so-called Emerald Coast attracts mundane and international people from all the world, world rushing to the long beaches of Dinar. Robert and his wife are invited for tea in saint Enogat by an eccentric woman first to obtain the Concours Prize, Judith Gauthier, daughter of the great writer Théophile Gauthier. And to another occasion, they also met the Grand Duke Kirill of Russia in the neighboring Sambriac. During winters, in order to be closer to the literary cycle of the Riviera, the service family rents an apartment in Nice Gambetta district and the poet breaks the rhythm of his solitary strolls to meet other writers already met during his Parisian bohemian time. 
visiting Somerset Morgan Place in Saint Jean Cap Ferrat, where all the great artists are regularly invited. Then, through his common publisher, Ernest Ben, Robert befriends with H. G. Wells, who live at Grass, and on other occasions, Robert met James Joyce, D. H. Lawrence, and other great personalities of the cultural world, who has now gone into oblivion, like Rex Ingram, producer at the famous Victorine studio in Nice. The poet, highly concerned by his physical condition, regularly exercised to stay in shape. But close to 50, Robert's medical checkup is alarming. His blood pressure is too high, and the poet is under an imminent threat of a nurse attack. Yearly cures at Raya in Auvergne are prescribed to Robert. This medical call to order inspires him to write a book of well-being advices for over 50 years old people. Why not grow young or living for longevity? A book far too precursory for the time, which will become a literary flop, sadly. Towards the end of the 30s, Robert's journalistic interest is kindled by the worrying rise of Marxist contestations and investigates by attending political meetings in Paris. In 1938, Robert wishes to check directly the situation in Russia. Arriving in Moscow, his daily program is devoted to visits of high places of Russian culture, which has are only reserved to foreigners. Under the close watch of the police, scrutinizing every move and attitudes, Robert decides to shorten his stay. Then, when back in France, the intrigue of a future book is slowly taking shape. Unfortunately, Robert's notes being incomplete, he needs to go back to Russia the following year. The writer ventures to sail on the Volga all the way down to the Black Sea, then taking a boat from Batum and Odessa, until the increasing threat of war compels him to get back to safer areas. When World War II breaks out, Robert sees the Luftwaffe squadrons flying over Varsov's sky. All borders are locked, and Robert has no other choice than escaping through the Baltics, then by the Scandinavian countries to reach England, and then after to join France, which remained a noteworthy dangerous journey. In June 1940, the German army reaches Brittany coast. The service family has only two hours to pack up one luggage each before escaping to England by the last boat boarding from Saint Malo. The following day, the German soldiers were knocking at his door to arrest him. Due to his war articles, Robert is considered as an English enemy. German soldiers occupy his house, which will be completely ransacked during the rout. During the years of war, the service family firstly stayed in Nekville in England. Then they share their time between Vancouver and Hollywood, where they contribute to the war effort. German and Iris stitching blankets for the Red Cross, and Robert reciting his famous poems to cheer up camp troops. Robert adds a string to his bow by playing his own role of poet in a western, The Spoilers where he performs with Marlene Dietrich, a film renowned thanks to his longest saloon fight between John Wayne and Randolph Scott. When peace returned, Robert and his family decide to settle down in Monte Carlo, in the Belle Epoque flat of a villa with a view over the Mediterranean Sea, where he will spend hours composing new poems. During an interview, Robert stated, I wish to keep on living in Monaco. Existence is so sweet here. My ambition is to become one of the principality of Monaco's deans. 
to do so Robert become an assiduous swimmer of Flavoto Beach from the first warm days of May until the end of October as a nice swimmer like he had always been. To celebrate the royal wedding of Monaco, Robert composes a poem celebrating Princess Grace that he offers to her with a dedicated poetry book. Moreover, Grace Kelly's parents had taken advantage of being at Monaco to visit Robert for tea time as they were a fan of his poetry. Summer times are spent on Brittany's coast freshness. Acquiring an increasing serenity, the poet appreciates the small joys of everyday existence. And Ron takes his new grandfather role with eye care. Thanksful for his lifetime's writing successes, Robert demonstrates generosity toward the village of Lancieux, where he financed the war monuments and gives many donations to the schools every year. Also in Monaco for St. Charles Church, offering the St. Charles of Borromeo wood statue which is inside. Self-made musician since his youth, Robert plays piano, banjo, guitar and accordion. It is no surprise that he composed the music and words of several joyful songs. The fall of the poet's life was the most verbose, publishing eight new books of poetry inspired by the imperishable memories of his fascinating years of adventures. In spite of being a discreet man avoiding public celebrations, Robert accepts to welcome in his living room the Canadian television who dedicates him one episode of the popular documentary series Close Up. The poet told reporters from Nice Matin covering the event. I'm going towards my 85th birthday, and you see Canadian television sent a six-man team here who have come with all this equipment to produce a movie before I die. Not knowing that it will be indeed his last public appearance. On September 11, 1958, the poet takes his usual morning walk along the seaside coast heading to Saint-Briac. A few hours later, he passes away from a heart attack. Robert Service is buried in the family vault in Lancieux. And his wife survived him, living up to the age of 103. And realizing one of her husband's wishes, live to be her hundred. Since the poet's death, many tributes have been paid in every places where he lived. In Scotland, the University of Glasgow awarded the Robert Service Prize to distinguish a thesis in the English class, of course. In Dawson City, the prospector's log cabin where Robert Service lived has been classified a historical monument. And during summer season, National Parks Canada organizes Robert Service poems recitation there. The Canadian government emitted a commemorative stamp with the famous Sam Maggie's as a. In Whitehorse, one of the main access roads is called. Robert Service Way and in Lancieux, a street has also been named after Robert Service. And even a plaque is on the tourism office wall of Lancieux. Many schools have also been given the name of the famous poet in Lancieux, in Anchorage, Alaska, in Scarborough, Ontario, and finally, of course, in Dawson City, Yukon. Robert Savage's work is deeply encored in the popular culture. For instance, the shooting of Dan McGrew was adapted in an animated cartoon by Tex Avery. Under the title, slightly changed, the shooting of Dan McGrew. Many singers have taken Robert Savage's poems to put them into music. For instance, the famous singer Johnny Cash adapted the cremation of Dan McGrew and country folk singer Joey MacDonald has also used Robert Savage's first World War poems for many songs. 
Painters have also been very inspired by Robert Service rhymes. Ted Harrison, who had fallen in love with Yukon's icy spaces, has illustrated wonderfully two of the most popular ballads of Robert, The Cremation of Sam Maggie and The Shooting of Dan Magoo. The Danish artist Barry Villemont illustrated with lithographies and original gouaches poems of Robert Service in Pale Port of Amber and A Grain of Sand. Robert Service had been quoted in movies, in commercials too, quite regularly. And recently, the mysterious tale of the poem about the cremation has been brought back into life in the first two parts of Under the Midnight Sun, a comic strip about the eternal travelling sailor Corto Maltese, created by Hugo Pratt. This was the last chapter of Robert William Service's life. Thank you for having listened to my great-grandfather's story.